and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Faith and the Victory Church. We're glad you joined us and glad to have you with us. We trust you'll have a blessed evening tonight. And uh, let's go ahead and jump right into things. And um, everybody remember that we have church on Sunday and on Wednesday, all right? And uh, we look forward to being together again on this coming Sunday as we continue to teach on the subject of love. So we uh, trust you guys will join us on Sunday also. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. All righty. Um, let's, let's go into um, turning my phone down after I share so that it doesn't. I just love that. Hallelujah. <coughs> Open your Bibles, if you will, to the 10th chapter of the book of Romans. Looking into the ninth verse, it says, um, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Praise God. Hallelujah. We talk, we've talked about this before, how that faith is um, of the heart and not of the head. It is a spiritual force. It is not a mental force. Um, it is what God has given to us to function by in, in his kingdom. Praise God. Because he functions by faith. Okay? Uh, when we recognize that Jesus is Lord, uh, we're born again. Okay, that's how we're born again, when we receive Jesus as Lord. Um, that's done with our spirit. It's a spiritual thing. Converting to Christianity through a mental, mental process is not the new birth. You know, I like the teachings of Christ, so I, I adopt the practice of Christianity as my way of living. That's not, that's not it. This is a faith matter of the heart and uh, not of the head again. Uh, the word lordship, we're talking about, you know, confessing Jesus as Lord, the word Lord comes from a word meaning bread provider. The one who sustains, protects, and cares for. So when we confess Jesus as Lord, we're confessing him as our bread provider. He's the one who protects us. He's the one who sustains us. He's the one who cares for us. Amen. Glory to God. And so we, we yield in that to the acknowledgement that he is superior, he is over us, although we're part of the body of Christ. He, you know, the Bible says something very interesting. He's the head. We're the body, he's the head. Now, he needs the body to function in the earth. The head will always do that, but the head's what's in charge. Okay? Your, your foot's not in charge. So your head tells your foot to move, it don't move. Okay? Um, so, and even the head regulates the involuntary muscles, the heart, and those kind of things. It's still regulating that. Uh, they're, they're, you know, uh, do it this way. Uh, shoot somebody in the head and see what happens to all their other muscles. You know, kill the brain so that it can, and, and the heart will stop beating. Just because it's involuntary doesn't mean it will work without the instructions that, that it receives out of the brain. Okay? You just don't get to tell your heart, beat, stop, beat, this, beat, beat. You don't, you don't get to control that it, it happens because it's, re it's it's automatically regulated through the brain the body of christ is the body of jesus but he's the head and we are at his behest we're at his willing will we're at his calling and uh yet he in that role of, of we submitting to that he he provides for us he sustains us he cares for us he protects us um when he came into our life he became our caretaker thank god we have a caretaker. Amen? Um, he assumes the respo that responsibility of your life when you're born again. Uh, look at how the Father look, thinks about us over here in Matthew chapter uh, 6. We kind of understand that the Lord's our caretaker. And he takes the responsibility of watching over us seriously. Actually, God doesn't do anything like uh, without seriousness or, you know, he... Uh, he is serious about stuff, okay? Uh, Matthew six twenty five. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. It is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns. <clears throat> yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? 
And the answer could be a, a big duh, okay, um, or a yes, all right. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how I mean, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil there, uh, or the trouble. You know, not, it doesn't have to be evil. It just can be trouble. It can be circumstances. It can be you didn't have enough you know, stuff around to, to do what you wanted to do or whatever. Don't take thought for that, okay? All righty. Now, he tells us here that the Father does care for us. In his lordship of our life, Jesus cares for us. Um, we're in the kingdom of God. Colossians 3.1, who hath delivered us in the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We have been found with his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, uh, he's, made his, he's made him sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Praise the Lord. So we're, we're his righteousness. We're in his kingdom. Hallelujah. And then, of course, we're in the family of God. Amen. Uh, Romans 8, 14 and 16, For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of adoption again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption where, I mean, I'm sorry, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And in 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Go, therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. So we, we have here Paul through his writings uh, and then other writers uh, lay out our status with God. We have, a, we have a wonderful status with the Father. Okay? He's not, he's not angry with you. He loves you. Sent Jesus to die for you. And even if you mess up, he's made provision for that, to cover that and to deal with it. Glory to God. I, I'm so excited. To me, that's grace. You, you want to talk about grace is not, um, it doesn't matter what I do. Grace is that if I, if I really mess up or semi-mess up, it doesn't have to be a really mess up. If I just mess up, I sin. He's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Well, that's grace. I didn't do, now I don't I don't deserve that. Even after all he's done for me, if I miss it, he still has a provision to fix it. Okay? He didn't cast me aside. Thank God for his love. Thank God for his grace. Can you say amen? Doesn't doesn't pat me on the back and say it doesn't matter, go ahead and do it again. Okay? But he does pick me up, pat, dust me off, and say, I forgive you. Amen. We're in so we're in his family. Not only are we in family and the family of God, we're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 17 says, If children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be uh, glorified together. Glory to God. So we're the heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ. Joint heirs, and he's the head, so he, he's the heir first. Amen? He's the, he's the elder, firstborn among many brethren. And according to John 16, 27, for the Father himself loveth you, because he's loved me, and have believed that I came, I mean, because you have loved me, and believed that I have come out from God. The Father now takes his position of care to love us and to care for us. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. Praise God. God, the Father, now takes the position of love 
and care for us because we've confessed Jesus as Lord, his lordship over our life, and the Father himself loves us. Remember, Jesus said, he said, the Father himself loveth you. Amen. Jesus, not only did Jesus love us, the Father loves us. Glory to God. And then John 14, 23, the hour cometh and now is that the true worshipers of God shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And what has We've taken our place as sons. We take our position. He takes his position to care and to love us. We take our position as the children of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the sons of God. Hallelujah. Not just, you know, not sinners saved by grace. So, so you know, we, can go, we, can go, we can get on one ditch one side of the road or the other ditch on the other side of the road. It's so easy to do. You know, uh, I can do anything I want to and get away with it, it don't matter. Or, you know, you get on the other side, and I'm so unworthy, I'm just a dog sinner. You know, uh, I just hope one of these days that I'll make it in. I mean, those are ditches. Um, kind of, I was back home like yesterday and uh, down east, back, back in Aden, and um, went out to my old high school to take some pictures and stuff. And, and I, I remember when they built the, the, that, what they call now, if you were from Aden, they still call it the four lane. Because, because Highway 11 was an old two lane road that ran through Winterville, back, the back way into Aden, out to Aden, and, and over to Grifton, all two lane roads. You, never, you had to go through, through all three of those cities to get to Kinston. So people who lived in Greenville, who worked at DuPont, um, had to drive those roads. They had to go through those three towns every day to go to work on a two lane road. Okay, then they built the bypass. They bypassed all those cities right outside of them, and it was a four lane. I mean, so we call it the four lane. Yeah. Okay, and that's, I mean, you probably go down there, people still call it the four lane out there, because that's what it's called, you know. I mean, it went right through the field we used to walk across and play in, you know, cut off a neighborhood from the city. Um, it was on far land in between, it wasn't, you know, uh, anything big, but it was, you know, just, it was the four lane. Um, so, but I remember when they built the four lane, we were, and I was at school, I remember being at school and how big the ditches were. Carol, because it's flat land, you got flat land out there. I mean, you know, you got to get, you got to get the ditches deep and, 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 and everything to run it off to the watersheds and stuff, or you'll, you'll just flood everything all the time, you know, the farmland and stuff. But um, I was out there, you know, yesterday, and I was I just kind of reminisced about how big those ditches are. I mean, just big old rascals out there. They weren't tiled. They're just you know, big ditches to run the water off and get it off the roads and get it, you know, and haul it off. And, um, you know, <clears throat> in your car, you don't want to run into either one. You don't want to drive over this ditch and then whip back on the road and get in that ditch, which would be hard to do because that one's so deep. But you don't, you don't want to be in the ditches. You want to be on, on the middle of the road. <coughs> out of the middle of the road, it's nice and dry and good, good, smooth driving. And we don't want to be in the ditch either, either side. We want to be in the middle of the road. Okay? And I guess you can have some ditches that aren't as deep as others. But I can tell you, you start running in and out of ditches, you, you will end up one that's so deep it can be hard to get out of. Okay? So, um, no, we, we are the sons of God. He loves us. We love him. Amen. He's taking his place as our care, caretaker and provider. We take our place as his sons. Okay. Hallelujah. Uh, according to first, uh, Philippians uh, 4.13, uh, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Uh, interesting, you know, they use which instead of who, um, because Christ is the anointed one in his anointing. We can do all things through the anointed one in his anointing, which strengthens us. Amen. Philippians 4.19, six verses down. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He meets our every need. Um, man, when God meets your need, that brings you to the end of worry, fear, doubt. The Father's your provider. He's your sustainer. It's, uh, that is his responsibility. Ours is to be doers of the word. James 1.22, but be you doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. Praise the Lord. And to fully trust him. Now, a lot of people, let me, let me read this verse, I'll come back, okay? Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, 6, trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not to thine own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Um, a lot of people's idea of trusting God is that when really bad stuff's going on, he's got a reason, and I just have to trust him that he knows what he's doing. And, and see, that, that's where, you, that's where we, we veer off from what's, what's true. I trust God. But I trust God with my life that he's there. He protects me. 
when I look back at the old covenant at his compound covenant names, I don't want to see one Jehovah the sickness giver or Jehovah the one that slaps you upside the head or Jehovah the, you know, the thief. I see Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I see Jehovah Rapha, my healer. Uh, you know, I see Jehovah um, Shama, the Lord, our banner of victory. Okay? I see the proverb saying, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. I know that when I enter into trouble, my Father's there to cover me, protect me, sustain me, and to bring me out. Okay? So my trust is based on the Word of God and what I know about God from His Word. Amen? That He's, he's my provider. He's my caretaker. He watches over me. You know, that, that song, the old full gospel business band used to sing all the time. They stand out in front of the meetings and it all goes, uh, Jesus is the rock of my salvation. His banner over me is love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a bunch of businessmen got boarding in filled with the Holy Ghost. They just went crazy. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> yeah, we'll pray. Go for it, guys. They did a lot of good things for the kingdom of God and the charismatic renewal. Praise God. I mean, they did a lot of cool stuff. And uh, there was a lot of people that got filled with the Holy Ghost because of full gospel businessmen and their, their women's branch aglow. That was their, that was their women's uh, wing of, the, of, that, of them. And uh, yeah, I just went how silly I I'm watching the delay here. Okay. Hallelujah. When you know. Now remember Jesus said this. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open that door, I and my father will come to him and sup with him and make our abode with him. When you, you know, when God is there, when God's taking up residence, now we abide in him, but he abides in us. Jesus said they'll, take, they'll make their abode in us. Amen. We abide under the shadow of the Almighty, but he abides in us. Glory to God. Um, and when that when we come to a revelation of that, we become situation masters. When you come to the revelation that the Father's in you, and you're in the Father, just like you're in the Son, the Son's in you, and just like the Son was in the Father, and the Father's in the Son. <coughs> Jesus said that they may be one in us, as we are, as thou art in me, and I in thee. I in thee. They may be one in us, in the same relationship that the Father and the Son had. He wanted us to have it with the Father and the Son. Amen. Um, Apostle Paul writes in the uh, fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, uh, verse 11, out of the J.B. Phillips translation, I have learned in what sort of state I am, therein, to be independent of the circumstances. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, I don't have King Jimmy here, so let me, let me go let's kind of give you King Jimmy's um, perspectives on this, how they, how they translated it. I ain't going to find it over there in Peter, I can tell you that. <laughs> All right. Um, Philippians 4.11, the King James says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned that whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Now, we you see, when we read certain things, we can run out and take them wrong. All right? And when you read this with a lot of the teaching in the church, like God knows what he's doing, you got to trust him, you know, you got to trust him because he made you sick for a reason, he took, he killed your spouse for a reason, your kids were killed by a tractor trailer running over them in the street for a reason, da 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 God has a reason for all of that, and I, you just have to trust God. And then, that whatever state you're in, I have to be content. You know, well, I just got to put up with it. And what Paul, you know, I love Phillips because he says, I've learned that when I, whatever, wh however I am, whatever I am in, I'm going to be independent of the circumstances. The circumstances don't govern my walk with the Lord. The circumstances don't govern my uh, revelation of the Lord. The circumstances don't govern uh, how I inter how the how me and the Lord uh, interact. His love for me, my love for Him. Okay. Um, when you really read this, Paul said, "You know, I know how to suffer lack and have abundance. You know, I've been initiated in all things." Different translation, kind of. Throwing a few things. Uh, I've been initiated in all kinds of situations of life. Um, one translation said this. I, 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 it's been frustrating myself for years because I, I read it and didn't write it down where I got it, and I can't find that translation. But he says, you know, I know I have want, and I, I know I have plenty, and I have, and I have I've, I've had lack, I've had much, 
you know, da 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 da. Uh, one translation said, I know how to have too much and not lose my head. I've learned how to walk in lack and not lose my voice. Okay? In all things, and then you can work through Phillips, I've learned how to be independent of the circumstances. Okay? You become situation masters. When you're the master of the situation, it doesn't master you. Okay? Lack doesn't master you. Why? Because you know he's your Jehovah Jireh. Too much doesn't master you. Why? Because you know that he's your Lord and you submitted to him and all things you have are his. Okay? You know, it's not going to govern your life. Your heart's toward him. All right? And so you become the situation master because of this relationship with the Lord. Uh, we're the Lord over circumstances because the greater one's in us. First, Second Corinthians 3, 4, and 5 says, And such trust have we through Christ and to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves <coughs> to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Another translation says, I am self-sufficient in all things with his sufficient. It says, I am self-sufficient with his sufficiency in all things. It just doesn't matter what's going on. You've already got the answer, and the answer is always victory. Okay? Hallelujah. And praise God. You know, uh, John wrote and said, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Praise the Lord. His ability causes us to prevail. He's our wisdom. He's our understanding. He gives us direction that we need to overcome. There, you know, uh, let me read this verse. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my son. Light is understanding. It deals with wisdom and understanding. Okay. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? And uh, real quick, hey, Dana. Uh, thanks for joining us. Hallelujah. Praise God. Dana was in our wedding. Glory to God. Amen. Anyway, back to this. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord is the light of our salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I, I be afraid? His wisdom and understanding gives us direction. Now, as we were in a meeting with um, Doug Jones a couple, couple of years ago uh, with Rama, and um, he said something that revolutionized my thinking about faith uh, in ways that not, I can't. That one single statement that revolutionized my approach and my thinking about faith that was so simple that it's, to, it's just completely revolutionized me, okay? Um, he was with Brother Hagin one day, and he, and he, he was, you know, when you teach at the school, you're teaching, <coughs> you, you're dealing with people uh, with healing at the healing school and that kind of stuff. And so he, some, he was some, and he had lived with Dad Hagin for a couple of years while he first came to Raymond and stuff. And, and so he, he goes sit down sometimes with him and talk, just pick his brain, you know. That's what you do. You go sit at the feet, you know, of, of your spiritual father. And um, we are not, not many people got to do that. I mean, you would love to you know, do that, but, you know, there are those who did. And, pray, and there's a reason that they did, you know. They were going to be the ones who carried things and were imparted things later uh, after he was gone. But he's, he went to the office and said, Dad, I, I don't want to talk to you. And he was talking about healing and stuff. He said, he just kind of looked at him and said, how much does being led by the Spirit have to do with healing? He said, Brother Hagin didn't flinch. He just looked at him and said, it's got everything to do with it. Of course, his next question is, why don't you ever teach that in the meetings? He said, because in the Crusades, what we're there for is we're, we're, try, we're trying to get as much to the people as fast as we can to get them healed. We can't do, we, can't, we don't have time to do this, which is really the pastor's job to teach some of these things. Okay? We've we got a crusade. They've come. There's, we're, we're, we're depending upon the, that special anointing to teach, to put faith in them, as much faith as we can get in them, to get them and to cooperate with the anointing and get them healed. That was the purpose of the meetings. Sure, you like to have it for eight weeks that you can go there and sit and learn how to receive, and then at the end of eight weeks. But that, you know, that was what he did. But the Lord changed his ministry, and he, he started going out and, and doing the big crusades that way, and that's what the Lord had him do. And he had to teach in line with what God was using to do right then. He had all this other wisdom. He said, it's got everything to do with it. Here, Jehovah's my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Amen? Are you here? Um, where did I lose that at? All right. Uh, the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When he's your wisdom, he will give you understanding. He will give you direction. He'll give you um, the things you have need of in order to walk with him and receive from him and get things done. He will give you wisdom when it's time to operate in your faith.
and you're stepping out to operate in faith, he may tell you, well, you got to do this. Well, I believe that I receive. I confess that I believe that I receive. See, um, and a lot of times, again, we're, take, we're taking maybe parts of a message or part of a teaching from a, a, a meeting where things are being taught to get as much faith into as many people as quick as you can, um, to get as much to as many people as you can, but come back around behind, the, you know, on, on the, and listen to the longer teachings or the, you know, the um, um, teachings where it was done over, over a longer period of time about a subject and you get more information. Okay? Um, you could, if you take a lot of times um, the meetings, the, the teachings just off of a crusade, you're never going to get the full picture. You just don't. Because, you know, there was things you couldn't develop there that you wanted to develop in the amount of time you had to do it, to do it in. Okay? So our pastors have to do that. We have to be the ones <coughs> who study and find out and understand and be able to go back and teach. You know? Uh, you're, you're believing God for such and such and such, but the wisdom, what does the wisdom of God tell you? Well, you know, he told me to do such and such. Or, um, back to my toe. You know? Um, I did not take it as a lack of faith on my part that I took medicine, was on IVs, went in the hospital and all that kind of stuff. I didn't, I didn't get my toe cut off. It's there. It's healed. Um, but I was, I was walking out what I knew in my heart I needed to walk out and put my faith in God the whole time. See, there's wisdom that comes from God. God will, God knows if you're ready or not for certain things or if you're at the, the level you need to be at for certain things. Um, guide your kids. Have your kids come to you and tell you they're going to buy a $400,000 house. Honey, you're not ready for that. You, hadn't even bought, you haven't even bought a smaller house. You know? Uh, yeah, but I'm going to use my faith and I'm going to get it. Yeah, but, you know, let's, let's start somewhere, whatever. You know, and um, and sometimes it's not the right thing. I, um, <laughs> you learn when you walk with God. You, and now, I'm going to ask this question. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to get that dumb look on your face. That it tells everybody in the room, you, that's, I'm talking to you. <laughs> okay? Get stoic and hold it together like Joe. Joe can be stoic. <laughs> it can't, Carrie. Carrie's not going to say anything. I was just trying to, I was just trying to drum up some business. <laughs> For marriage counseling. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> um, Jamie and I bought our first home, and we, were, we had lived there for, um, oh, we'd been in the house six or seven years. And uh, we, we had had three, we had three kids. I mean, we had two bedrooms, we had three bedrooms and three kids, um, and running out of space. I mean, and, and they weren't, they were just still little. They were still tiny tots, you know. Nathan was crawling. You know, um, Jesse, uh, we, it's a good thing we had a fenced in backyard because anyway, that, her, her papa used to say that was one busy youngin. And that's Eastern Carolina for you're into everything. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so we started looking for another house and, uh, we actually looked at the house we're in now and, uh, they had, they had, the brick wasn't painted at the time. It was a kind of a pinky white white looking brick with white vinyl on it. James, I don't like that house. And, you know, but, you know, we kind of pursued it, looking at it a little bit and the prices. And, nah, that's, you know, we just, so we, we went to another house in another neighborhood, smaller neighborhood, closer together, smaller lots. Um, we, we were able to, in our main, our thinking, afford this house. And uh, so we, we ended up put, putting an offer in to build a house. Okay. And to build the house and, you know, to um, get it done and all this kind of stuff. And as we started down the process, something on the inside just kept scratching. You know, uh, we just kept pursuing it. Built, build it with a contingency. You know, sometimes you know, with these, what they call spec builders, they spec houses. So they speculate, you know, on the fact that you're going to sell your house. So we, we sign with the contingency, we sell our house. Okay. Um, down payment gets back if we don't sell our house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Man, you couldn't kidnap people and kid them to come look at our house. I'm telling you, we did everything that on the planet you could think of to get them in there, except 
go down, knock them out, drag them in, put them in the house, and come come buy it. Okay, uh, one guy one guy kept came looked at it three times, but he wanted to uh, lowball it by over ten thousand dollars and wouldn't move. <laughs> See you later, alligator. Ain't happening, you know. And um, and so we we I did the Jericho marches. We called the house soap. We anointed with oil. We rode by the other house. We decreed and said it's ours in Jesus' name. But something on the inside was saying no. Well, I can have what I say. I, I get behind me, Satan. Sometimes it ain't Satan. A lot of times it's not Satan. <clears throat> You're letting your wants override the leading of the Spirit or the wisdom of God. Okay? And so um, we kept going and kept going and kept going. And I remember we, we left and went on our first missions trip as a family. I, I, I was teaching in um, Germany. I was teaching in, um, in the German Bible school. And so we, we, the whole family flew over, little guy. I mean, we had the little guy in the seat, you know. Actually, he was, we lay him in the floor. Back then, you didn't, we, you didn't sit, put him in the seat. We just lay him in the floor with blankets and let him sleep in the bottom of the floor of the plane. And, you know, I mean, we, we sat, we'd come in on the plane, and, and people around start grumbling because you got kids on the plane. And then the stewards would come by after the flight because we had the best behaved kids they'd ever seen. You know, you know, and we 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 knew the tricks. They say, "Okay, pastors, please be seated. We're about to whatever." Diamond tap. <laughs> we go down the road with diamond tap. <laughs> and we had toys for them to play with. We kept, we had Polly pockets. We had all kinds. Of, we had all kinds of stuff to keep them entertained. Um, it was, you know, we were we were able to do it. We came back from that trip. It was a two-week trip because we did Germany. We took a week. Of, we took an extra week. We drove over to France. Drove, drove to Paris and stuff. And uh, we got back. We went in the house, and they had changed all the specs we had put in it. We had paid for. We were paying for flat ceilings. We were paying for a certain color fl flooring, certain color, color cabinet tops, certain color wall paint. I don't know if you remember the era back in the uh, '90s. Uh, what everybody did was they painted every house antique white with antique white trim because it was. It was neutral. You might like antique white. I don't like antique white. I don't like it. It just to me. Now this is me. You both. Me, me, you may think it's the best thing since peanut butter and sliced bread, and that's your right to think that. Okay, and uh, it doesn't make me right and you wrong. But personally, I think it looks dirty all the time because it's dark. It doesn't reflect. <clears throat> so we we were having the walls painted white with white trim with uh, two, two ounces of black and a gallon of white trim, which made it separate. And what they, and the painter told me this. He had put two ounces of white, of black in every gallon, and it'll make the, um, the white trim just pop off. And it did. Yeah. So B10 in a five-gallon bucket. Okay, B2 in a two-gallon bucket. And he was right. It made the white trim just really... And we did it on new... Well, we get new ones because they already painted it. But if we ever repaint all the trim, it's going to be done that way. So it really snaps it off. They had changed it. They had gone to antique white. They had sprayed the ceilings with the popcorns. They had white countertops and white cabinets and white flooring. I, like, I thought, you know, where's my earring? Where's my bald head? Because I'm Mr. Clean right now. And so we went back and saw the, um, the realtor the next day uh, at, the, at the office and said, what they do to the house? Well, you didn't sell your house in time. But we, we, you can still buy it, you know, if you get sold. I said, no, give us some money back. We're not buying that. I said, you changed everything about it. I said, I don't want that house. You know? So we, 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 we you know, and we were so excited about moving into a bigger house and all that kind of stuff. We were disappointed. You know, we were kind of disappointed that even though we were kind of getting no, we were trying to override that with the Jericho marches, with our faith. We're confessing. We're, see, God the whole time is trying to stop us from going down that path. And we're not listening. What does wisdom have to do? What does being led by the Spirit have to do with your healing? You know? What does it have to do with your faith? It's got everything to do with it. So we, we went back home, stopped, uh, about, uh, and, and kind of came to the conclusion in a few months that we just need to kind of update our home and be happy here for a while. So we replaced all the carpet, replaced the vinyl flooring in the kitchen, um, kitchen area and the, and the bathrooms, all new carpet throughout the entire house, uh, put some, um, you know, painted the walls, changed the color of the walls, put the border up, and you know, we had changed from different, you know, 
the tones of the house completely different, all that kind of stuff. And I bet it was less than a year after that, got the itch to buy again. Uh huh. We were, we were we we had gone. Okay, we're gonna be happy here. See, God's leading us. Went back and saw Jane had a magazine, saw that white house that we're in now, and we went over. She said, "We were in this house before. We want this color." I said, really? So we just called the realtor on the spot. And said, "Can you come show it to us?" And we went in, and we loved it. Okay, loved it. I mean, this was this is the house. Just fell in love with it because they got the white paint on the that brick, so the white final siding of that that brick kind of blended much, much better. Didn't have that whatever. So we live in Casablanca. Okay? All right. And um, we didn't have any problems selling the other house. As a matter of fact, we went outside one day, and, and we, you know, people, we, we were selling by owner, and um, uh, we had Janelle Spencer as doing our co-broker. And um, she, you know, she would co-broker for us. And, um, We we're out of the little flyers we made, putting those little tubes on top of the sign. You know, for sale by owner, we had to look. We're out. And this, as I walked outside, and this lady sitting in her car across the street looking at the house. I was aggressive. And when I said, are you looking at the house? She said, yeah, there wasn't any uh, things in the box. I said, hold on. I went in the house and printed some. Came back out and said, here. She said, I just love this house. She said, I'm not here. I was thinking, uh, you know, I love that house. She said, goes, I'm from Rocky Mount. And I said, well, I'm from Greenville. You know, Rocky Mount's 45 miles from Greenville. It's real close. And, um, you know, eat the same kind of barbecue. I mean, same kind of, you know, the tobacco farmers. It's all kind of the same culture. And, we, and that house was a farmhouse with a big wraparound front porch. Eight foot on the front, six foot down the side, big swings, you know, rocking chairs. Sit outside when it was pouring down, raining, just, just enjoy it. And, you know, just love it. I had the ceiling fans on the porch, so, you know, when it was hot and the wind, we got it. We got a breeze on there. And she's sitting there looking. I just love this house. I just sit here and think about, you know, swinging and swinging and rocking on the porch and stuff. And Okay, lady. You know, she, they bought the house. Okay? And so we were able to come back, you know, to the other house. And um, he had already dropped that house. The thing is, when we first looked at the house when it wasn't painted, he, his price was $40,000 more than what he sold it to us for. He had dropped it like thirty five, and then dropped it another five. Yeah. See, when you're led by the Spirit of God, you can walk in things, you know, it has everything to do with our faith. Wisdom comes from God. And, um, and this time, we had a different inside. We didn't have to do Jericho marches. Our faith, see, a lot, a lot of things we did the first time, we were trying to make faith work. The second time, our faith was working. Because we were being led, we knew it whole different ballgame. And he's our light and our salvation. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you understanding. He'll, as you start down things, you'll know. And sometimes we're trying to use our faith in ways when he's saying no, it ain't going to work. Why? Because really in your heart you know it's not right. It's already in there. You already got the no instead of the yes. Well, I can have what I say. Yeah, go ahead, dummy. Get what God does, is not leading you to get. Are you here? Why'd you call me dummy? Because if you keep overriding that, you're going to end up with stuff you don't want or shouldn't have or go, in the wrong, go, go the wrong direction. He'll just let you go. He'll let you go if you keep pushing it and keep pushing it and keep pushing it and just, just determine to go a certain direction with things. And it costs you. It costs you in the long run. It certainly does. Amen? Hallelujah. And so he is our light and our salvation. He's our wisdom, praise God. Glory to God. Um, Psalm 56, 9 says, When I cry unto thee, thou sh uh, then shall my enemies turn back. For this I know, for God is for me. And the 46th Psalm, verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So our the salvation and our redemption is over Satan's dominion. We have no fear of defeat, sickness, disease, poverty, or death itself. Because we are masters of Satan now, we have a new song to sing. Amen. Um, glory to God. Amen. God is our refuge and God is our strength. A very present help in trouble. Probably messed that note up. Anyway, listen to Psalm 41 1, 10. Fear not, for 
for I am with thee. Be not dismayed. I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. <coughs> That's right. The greater one, Emmanuel, the Almighty, El Shaddai, the Eternal, great God, Jehovah, the Creator, the I am that I am. He is with you in every situation. He is in you in every situation. And he strengthens you with power. As Zerubbabel 4, 6 says, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. He causes us to be able to face every situation of life as victor and master, because the greater one in us, the caretaker, the provider, our all in all is on the inside of us. Amen? You're of God, little children, First John 4, 4. And have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When we recognize that God is in us, and I say it this way, we must become God inside minded. Okay? He, is our, he's, he, he indwells you all the time. He's there. His limitless resources are at our disposal. He is there to meet every need. He only, we only need to respond in faith to the word of God, and he's on the move on our behalf. Amen? Uh, Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. We are limitless as long as we abide in him. Whatever the vine has, the branches can draw from. Okay? If you, verse, verse 7 goes on and says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Amen? Glory to God. Say this with me. Say, I am a new creation. I have passed from death unto life. The life of God now dwells in me. The greater one lives in me. Whatever he can do, I can do. Because he's in me. His ability is my ability. His strength is my strength. His wisdom is my wisdom. I can do all things through the greater one who strengthens me. I am who he says I am. I can do what he says I can do. I will go where he says go because he enables me. I shall not fail. Hallelujah. Amen? Glory to God. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Well, we're so glad you could be here tonight. Thank all y'all for joining us tonight. Um, if it gets up there before we get off the air, you, we'd love to have you... Uh, Join and support us here at Faith and Victory Church and our work for the kingdom of God. Uh, we can do that through PayPal. Our, um, our PayPal uh, name is donations at fvc.org, Faith Victory Church, so fvc.org, donations at fvc.org. Our square cash is a whole nother animal. Hashtag, huh? Oh, it's on the screen now. Our, um, oh, okay. My screen ain't showing stuff. So, glory. I don't know why. Mine's probably delayed. I'm, I'm, I'm running a little behind here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. But we'd love to have you join us in, in giving and supporting what we do for the kingdom of God. Glory to God. Until we meet again, remember this, that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Praise God. I love you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church. Yeah.